Everybody, welcome back to another video. This one might be a little bit long because today we're talking about the full frame 1.5X anamorphics, the Mercuries from Atlas Lens Co. Now there's kind of a lot to break down with these lenses, so let's get into it. But first, a quick disclaimer. Disclaimer to start this video. One, I absolutely love Atlas Lens Co. We have done so much stuff with the Orions over the years and I absolutely love them. They're my personal favorite uh, lens set. So I'm very excited to talk about these Mercuries, but as a disclaimer, they do have some pre-production, possibly functional operational issues that we're going to cover. So hopefully by the time these get out to the public, some of these things might be addressed and fixed because in my opinion, it greatly hinders the ability to use them. So with that, we're gonna have a little discussion about character really quick. Okay, what is character? I think we've been using the term inappropriately and we've been using it on a scale of more or less, equaling more interesting or less interesting. And I feel like that's a little bit inappropriate. All lenses have character. Sharpness is a character. Lack of sharpness is a character. There's several traits that all make up an overall character of a lens. Now, when we're talking about the Mercuries, I feel like these are at the extreme in one direction in several different categories, and we're gonna break those down and see how maybe for the first time, character has started to bleed over into functionality. And this is a first for me out of all the lenses I've ever played with, having to understand how that character bleeds into lens usability. So we did some tests in the studio, sent Galen out to shoot some footage out on the street, shot these both in full frame mode, super 35 mode, and then compared these to another super 35 anamorphic set that Atlas makes, the Orions, just to see how character plays into the overall aesthetic and usability in multiple formats, you know, being that these are full frame and 1.5. So 1.5X anamorphics, what makes them special? Well, 1.3.3 and 1.5 are both easy to de-squeeze from 16 by nine, which is really nice. And 1.5 just gives that little extra squeeze when you're talking about uh, oval looking bokeh, which is really nice. So it just makes sense that there are some options in this lineup. There's the Techno Visions, there's the Isco for All, there's DIY scope options, and now there's these Mercuries. But in the grand scheme of things, four options is not that much, and they all do kind of have a very similar look to them in terms of performance and usability, which is very interesting to me um, as a whole that 1.5 breeds a similar look. Now, the Mercuries on their own have some very unique qualities that the other ones don't that we're gonna talk about, but I'm really glad Atlas saw the hole in the market and decided to make a 1.5 anamorphic that is accessible for everybody. One other very large hashtag asterisk uh, disclaimer. This is solely opinion based, but this is my opinion as a shooter, as a producer, as somebody who's worked with tons of clients and had a lot of experience over the years, trying to present this as our findings through studio testing, not just wild opinion, but I do have some negative things to say about these lenses later. So keep in mind, it's all opinion. You can love them, I can love them. You can think whatever you want, but this is just my opinion and take it for what you will. Let's get into the studio testing. We're gonna play some clips. I'm just gonna talk over them. First, on full frame format on the mini LF, 
shooting uh, three by two open gate with a 1.5 D squeeze. We're gonna show you the 36 millimeter lens. Now, it's really interesting here if you're looking at distortion, these lenses have crazy distortion, uh, edge of frame, top and bottom of frame, and uh, the fall off in the look from close focus is really pretty and really nice when you know there's faces in near center of the frame, the way it falls off is very pretty, uh, but, Getting into the other parts of these lenses, uh, if you look as we pan Galen towards the center, now he's gonna be centered up, looks very even, straight to camera. As we pan him towards the edge of frame, it almost looks like his whole body turns 45 degrees on an axis, and I don't know how you would correct that in post. It's not barrel, it's not pin cushion, it's not something that you can fix, and this to me is a little worrisome. His worlds are going to feel very strange panning is going to feel very strange. Um, so that is one thing to look at. And one other thing to look at on here is uh, center sharpness and how the fall off affects that. Now, with this lens specifically, it's very interesting. As you move off the crosshairs left or right, even to the, the middle between the edge of frame, focus fall off happens very quickly. Now, this is not something that is new for an anamorphic because that's how lots of anamorphics uh, behave. But the thing that's really interesting with these lenses because the fronts are so concave is that it's not like it falls out of focus, it falls out of focus front to back. So if you wanted to keep Galen in focus as we pan or any subject for that matter, you're gonna have to be ready to pull focus front or back to keep them in focus, but just remember anything else on the same plane is then going to appear to be out of focus closer to center of frame, which is a first for me in testing lenses. And I feel like that could be confusing for a lot of people, ACs uh, who haven't worked with these lenses before. So it's something to keep into consideration. Now also, as we get towards the edge of frame, you can tell that almost a vertical squeeze starts to feel different for faces, so if you are edging somebody on the edge of frame, I would just highly recommend against it in general. Now, another thing to note on these lenses is the breathing. They breathe so incredibly much. It's like if you had your frame all cleared out and you got everything looking good, you got action, and then you pull focus from front to back, you might reveal 10 C stands out of frame. I don't know, it's very extreme, and the way the focus falls off and the alignment maybe of the elements on the edge of frame starts to get real murky and muddy. I don't think you could really put much in there that you want to actually see and keep focus on. All right, when we're talking about the flares, there's just a lot happening. And it's so much happening that I feel like your eye starts to just completely be engrossed in what's happening with the flares and less in the story. And I feel like that, to me, becomes an issue taking people out of the story, um, which I'm never really a fan of, but you'll notice different color streaks, multiple layers of streaks, vertical layers of streaks, orbs, rainbows, uh, like streaky spherical looking things. There's just a lot happening. Always a time and a place for it, but there's just a lot. Might be a tough sell with clients, but in general, that's the 36. There's kind of a lot going on uh, with it. So let's move on to the 42. Okay, in the 42, everything is controlled a little bit more, but you'll see Weirdly that the 42 may have more distortion across the top and bottom of frame with straight lines, if you notice the bar in the back as we pan and tilt. Uh, also, the 42 seems a little bit softer and almost has more halation than the 36, which is also interesting. The breathing is still pretty intense, but it's a little bit more controlled. Overall, a lot of the same characters still applies in terms of focus going in and out as you move off the crosshairs, both left and right and top and bottom. Uh, and it's still same thing applies, forward and back focus needs to change if you are panning somebody off the crosshairs and want to keep them in focus. Same thing also applies on the edge of frame with faces. As we stop down, we do see a lot of that gets fixed, but as an overall note between these two lenses, the 36 and the 42, even stop down to let's say uh, four, five, six split, which is where we were. You do get some of that sharpness back, but even at most, I would say if you were trying to crop in on multiple places in frame for like different deliverables, or if you wanted to use the whole frame to crop out to take things for like social posts or whatnot, I really think without fully measuring it, that maybe 20% of your frame might be sharp enough to do that, um, which is hard in my opinion to work with. Now, um,
that's the 42. Let's move on to the 54. So the 54 now is much more controlled across the board, both wide open and stop down, but almost to a detriment. The 36 now looks so different seeing them side by side. It's kind of hard to imagine shooting these two lenses in the same scene given how wildly different the distortion, the breathing, the flares, and some of all of that stuff looks. But in general, a little bit nicer control with breathing, a little bit nicer control with focus and sharpness. Um, but still, you do have that narrow window of focus close to center that drops off very fast as you pan away. Now, as we stop down, things get a little bit more controlled from there as well. But now we're stopping down to a four, five, six split to really bring some of that control back. And I don't know, for some of you, that might be a hard place to shoot a lot of time. So that's the 54. Does look a lot better. Offers you some more of that traditional anamorphic look wide open if you're shooting close-ups. A lot of opal bokeh, it's very nice. Um, but. on to the 72. All right, here's the 72 millimeter. Everything here again, way more controlled. Everything is basically fixed in terms of breathing, distortion, everything else. But strangely, on the 72, you have a way crazier field of uh, focus fall off from center that is actually very, very weird. And I'm gonna show you a clip that we did that I've never seen before in my life, and it is absolutely the wildest thing. I think I had some uh, kind of interesting obscenities to shout out as I was looking at this in the viewfinder. I can record this. Both of you guys look into camera. What the f <laughs> This is the weirdest shit I've ever seen. But we decided to take a two shot, just two, like a medium close, two people in frame, frame left, frame right. Something that's very common if you're doing interviews or whatnot. Anyway, this is a, a weird anomaly that I, I don't know if I can explain, but seeing them in person based on the how the lens is concave, when you try to get both the eyes in focus, which is almost impossible to do to start with, the center point of the dead space between the two subjects, which is a focal point, kind of drops off in a way that feels almost surreal. Um, the only way I can really describe the look is almost like a split diopter type of effect. But the thing that really strikes me as odd that I don't know how I could work around this in any sort of practical way on set, is if you look at Galen on the side of frame, one eye is in focus that is closer to frame, to center, and his other eye goes out, which is acceptable, I understand that for an anamorphic, but the thing that is extra crazy is that his ear that is closer to the edge of frame is tack sharp, but the ear that is closer to the middle of frame is out of focus. And I don't know, we measured Galen's head to make sure nothing was weird and everything checks out. He's a normal human being. And I don't understand how to work with this kind of thing because there are lots of times in which you want to put people left or right of the crosshairs. And this is going to be a thing where your AC is gonna be having to make executive decisions on 
Is it the ear? Is it the face? Is it the nose? Is it the eyes? I don't know. They're all kind of going everywhere. And without comms on set and trying to do things, I think this is gonna end up creating a lot of confusion. It cleans up a little bit when you stop down, but it is a weird effect. And this happens on some other lenses too, but the 72 is most noticeable um, and something that doesn't happen on the other lenses. So. That is a 72. Now we're gonna move into a uh, version of Super 35 format to see how these clean up in Super 35. So for Super 35, we essentially just shot the exact same thing. We punched into Super 35 three by two on the Mini LF and moved the camera back to compensate for the distance lost in the format change, shot everything again. Now, as a whole, everything in general in Super 35 cleans up. I feel like these are infinitely more usable in Super 35. That being said, the flares are still very over the top. They're a lot to deal with. It is tough. I think that would be a tough sell for any client when you're talking about giving them a deliverable if it's not just like a random B-roll shot here or there. But otherwise in Super 35, things do clean up. Breathing is not affected, as that's a property of the lens. Things still breathe pretty heavily on the 36 and the 42, but now that we're cropped in on the frame, we do notice much better and much cleaner distortion. Edge of frame sharpness is a lot better. Still unusable, quote unquote, in the terms that there isn't actually sharpness on the edge of frame that you could use or frame somebody in, but it is definitely less soft than the full frame equivalent of that. So. The biggest takeaway that I have in Super 35 isn't wide open. There's plenty of character uh, that you see from the distortion and the softness and everything happening in Super 35 wide open, but I think you really need to be wide open in Super 35 to see really any of the anamorphic characteristics. The downside to that is that wide open, you do still have a very narrow window of sharpness that you can put people in if you want eyes and faces to be sharp enough to what I call connect with on frame. Now, big thing here is as you stop down to gain some of that stuff back uh, in terms of sharpness and performance, these lenses start looking very spherical very, very, very quickly. I would say from a 2.8 and down, where we shot especially at a 4.56 split, almost every part of them feels and looks spherical and, but old spherical, like an old vintage lens because you still keep the distortion and things, but the bokeh, unless you're shooting extreme close focus, it really doesn't feel anamorphic. Now, the other thing we found in testing on the 36 and the 42 is because the breathing is so intense, I really feel like there is a different squeeze ratio happening throughout the focal range that you need to be aware of as you are pulling focus and doing things on those two lenses specifically. It's not noticeable on the 54 or the 72, but on the 36, I think there might be some issues there that might be a little bit tough. Now, on the 35, if you are wanting to stop down and your clients need the option to have things be usable, sharp, you wanna punch in on people's faces, I think you do need to stop down when you stop down, you start talking about losing the character. Now, if you are willing to shoot these in Super 35 and that's your plan and that's all you're gonna do, I really feel like then you should start to consider 
all of the 2X lenses that are out there. Now we, as a comparison, shot in Super 35 with the Atlas Orions. We shot these at a T2.3 to match what the Mercury's are wide open, just to show how much different the left to right pan and the top to bottom uh, tilt is when you're talking about sharpness and fall off and all of those things. And it's very apparent right away that one, you have obviously a lot more of the anamorphic look because we're 2X, but how much more usable sharpness there is from side to side if you did want to use something that's just not right on the crosshairs as a pullout for let's say an Instagram or a TikTok deliverable. So, so going through some of those, we see that those are quite a bit different. If you are wanting to stop down to use these, I'm not sure why you wouldn't just shoot on something like a Koa that has a very, very similar look in my opinion if you're in Super 35, but now with a lens that performs very much like a normal lens. You can pan off people from center. They will stay in focus as you go away. The flares are a little more manageable. The distortion is a little bit more controlled and you can shoot 2X at a four and still have a lot of anamorphic character that you really lose at a four with the Mercury's. So really do feel like in general as a whole with the Mercury's both full frame and in um, Super 35 that you want to be shooting people in these like really nice like mediums to medium close-ups to really exaggerate that fall off and have that really nice oval bokeh happening in the background. All right, now that we've talked about the lenses from an aesthetic standpoint, let's talk about them from a mechanical standpoint. Now, these lenses are very small, very, very small for an anamorphic, which is great if you like them small, but small is going to come with some drawbacks. Namely, because they're small means there's a lot less you can do internally to affect breathing. And that is very, very apparent as we've seen on the 36 and the 42. So while this is a blessing that they're small, it is a curse that it exhibits a lot more uh, breathing, which is kind of hard to deal with in a multitude of scenarios. Now, the other nice thing about these is while small means the gears are going to be in an interesting place. So the iris gear basically touches almost every PL mount we have here at the shop. And the only way you're really gonna be get, able to get a motor on that gear is if you have a cage with a top rail just how it is. But even still, if you have a cage with a top rail, if you're using a system like an Airy or a uh, Venice that has ears on the PL mount, it's gonna be really tough to kind of like tuck the motor between those and get everything working properly. So that to me is a downside. It just means rigging is gonna be a pain. It does mean it's gonna be compact. It's just gonna be tough and you're gonna need to know that before going in. Now for our specific use, 
We had the Mini LF, and we were using our 15 millimeter lightweight uh, support on the bottom, and we couldn't even get an FF4 follow focus manual to touch the uh, focus gears on this lens, which was kind of a pain. So we had to do all of our tests pulling by hand. Um, so just based on your rig, it might be tough to even get a follow focus gear onto your lens if you're doing a manual uh, or a geared motor. Just depends on your setup, but be aware of that as that is a real thing. Now, let's talk about pricing. These are going to be $8,000 a piece. So to me, these are a very professional solution that is going to cost, you know, I would imagine a set of these is going to be, you know, thirty-two dollars to $40,000 once there's a fifth lens option out there. It's an $800 to $1,000 a day rental. It's going to be expensive. So you're using these in pro environments, on pro systems. I feel like there should be maybe a little bit more thought into how these were designed mechanically to make it a little bit easier in a pro environment to get these rigged up efficiently. So that's my only opinion there. It was a pain to set these up in our studio and we have all the stuff here. So uh, that's one drawback from them, in my opinion. Now, at $40,000 for a set of five, these are going to make their way onto lots of pro sets. And when you're talking about pro sets, usually pro sets have one thing in common. There's always a client there. And this is where I get into the heavy disclaimer section of my opinion. But because these lenses are so soft in full frame mode, it's going to be very tough to satisfy your client and your director if you were the DP choosing the tool. Now, if I was given this, I said, oh, I wanna bring these Mercury's on. I think the look is great, it's gonna be awesome. I really feel like you are then going to have to bring up uh, the subject to your director and to your client about what you can and can't do from an expectation of framing and blocking. To me, I'm not a big fan of having my lenses so heavily dictate what I can and can't do on set. Now, if a director asks me a very simple thing of like, hey, I wanna shoot a French over, I wanna do a, a two shot, I gotta say, do you want their eyes in focus? And they're gonna say, yes, I'm gonna say, sorry, that's not going to happen probably. So, that's kind of a bummer. Very basic, simple things, these lenses will have a hard time doing. I'm a huge fan of when I'm shooting, you know, two four to one aspect ratio, giving people a little haircut. If you try to frame somebody's eyes between the crosshairs and the top of your frame, chances are the eyes are going to be soft. And as you're following them in normal motion as a camera operator, they're going to be varying degrees of out of focus that if you then leave that on the focus puller to try to get, they just never will. So now there's gonna be a lot of focus hunting, trying to keep things in focus. I feel like that is also going to be part of the usability factor for ACs who haven't worked with these lenses to understand the process because they do operate differently than pretty much any lens I've ever used. So, gonna need more time and prep, gonna need more experience with them if you want to pull on these effectively, but also there's just a long list of things that you can and can't do with them that might not make your client very happy. Biggest thing for me, my clients that I shoot for oftentimes want to pull tons of different deliverables. It's 2023, there's Facebook, there's TikTok, there's Instagram, all have different aspect ratios that I need to deliver for. Pretty much means now with all these lenses having such a narrow window of sharpness, I have to put everything dead center. That is the only place they're gonna be able to pull from if they want to extract different parts and I have to let them know that up front because I don't wanna be the guy who ruins my relationship with a client or with a director because I chose these lenses and left them with such few options in post. Now, if you're ready to make that commitment, these lenses are perfect. But as a lens that kind of does so little so extremely, the amount of jobs that these are going to be suited for in 2023 and beyond, I feel like start to become less and less. And for a $40,000 set of lenses, if you're thinking about buying a set, really narrows down the amount of times you can take them out, which means it's hard to make your money back on them. So, all things to consider when using, buying, all of that stuff. Now, personally, for our rental house, we canceled our pre-order. After our testing and finding out our results, I personally think if I were to rent these out to people, I'm gonna be getting calls from angry producers asking if our lenses are broken because 
they can't do X, Y, and Z in post and they're too soft, they're not calibrated, blah, 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 when it's actually just the lens and nothing we can control on our end. And as a, a rental house, that is the last conversation I wanna have is with some angry producer asking about the quality and upkeep and maintenance of our lenses when we have zero control of it. Now, there will be people that want to rent these lenses and we will be able to get them for you, but we personally have written a clause into our rental agreements now about the Mercury's that specifically states that. So keeping things honest and open for clients is gonna be a thing, but again, these are pre-production models. Maybe this can change by the time they hit production, but in the current form, it will be a little scary for me to carry these and carry them confidently for clients. All right, that is our big giant overview of the Atlas Mercury's. Now, in closing, I do wanna say, I love what Atlas is doing. I love that they're pushing boundaries. I like that they're willing to go where people in the market aren't so heavy character in one direction. I really applaud the approach. I do hope some things change from a usability factor before these go live, but in general, what they're doing and trying to find the holes in the market to fulfill are really amazing, and I will always support Atlas for their efforts in that. When it comes to the Atlas Mercury specifically, I think it's gonna be a tough call if you wanna shoot on these as a DP. It's gonna be really tough to say I'm responsible for the lens choice and bring these in and have such few options to shoot from a framing and blocking standpoint as well as uh, a limited post standpoint. So if you're willing to put your name on the line and bring these lenses to set, that's great. Personally, it scares me quite a bit, uh, but that is the joy of having so many options for lenses. So in closing, I would say if you're interested in these and you can find them, try them out, check them out. Also, if you want character, there are also lots of 2X anamorphic lenses on the market. Like anything from old fast glass, you'll probably find Cineo Vision, X-Dolls, Scorpions, what is it, the Scorpios. Uh, there's so many old vintage looking lenses that you can get a similar look to the Mercury's, but with a little bit less of the hassle overall. So just play with things. If you have an order in, don't be scared. I'm sure things will change by the time they get delivered, but I felt it was right to make this honest review of our findings because some of these findings do dictate operational use on set and that needs to be said so you don't go in with the wrong expectations when you're shooting these lenses. All in all, they have a great look, they're super interesting, and if you're cool with that, that's awesome. I found some really fun looks with these myself. It's just a little bit of the operational things that have me a little bit worried. All right, y'all, thanks for sticking around for that super long video. Sorry it was so in depth. I feel like there was just a few things that need to be said about these lenses specifically before they go to production. So with that, thank you again. Remember, like and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We're always here trying to do deep dives into lenses and cameras, so please come back for the next one and we'll catch you soon.